And I promise you there's only 95 slides, so hopefully we can do this in a reasonable time frame. So, hope you've had a good Sabbath afternoon. We went to the zoo and we had a good time seeing some animals and getting some fresh air and sunshine that was good for us. We did, finally, we had not gone to see the elephants yet. So we said, we got to just find some time and carve some out. And we went and saw the elephants, and they are cute as dickens. So we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and then we will talk about the, the trip. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, what a beautiful day you gave us. What a good Sabbath day. Uh, to be out and see the beautiful things you've made for us. Father, thank you uh, for all the ways that you have worked through history in the past. Father, it's not just a history lesson today. It's, it's a lesson about your ways and your purposes and uh, how you have moved on the hearts of men and women for centuries. We pray, Father, that you will bless us as we take some time to understand tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Something like this, taking a New Testament trip, uh, for me, it adds context to the Bible. I, I read the Bible, I've read the stories of the Bible, but when I go on a trip like this, it adds context and helps me understand, oh, well, you know, that where the buildings were that are talked about or uh, understand how difficult it was for armies to make their way up to that location. Uh, just to see it visually uh, is really helpful. And then we get a lot of detail from hired guides that are with us and they show us all that or tell us all that information. And some of it we remember and not so much or not always all the information. It's, it's the museum <laughs> of much of ancient history. And they have dug up many places, archeological digs, and, and, and so they know a lot about things that happened in the, in the past. But our guide told us that we have, or that Turkey has at least 500 other sites that are really not uh, dug up and 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 maybe we we know where they are but we don't know much about them because they haven't really had enough time and money to research all this so if you want to donate some money so i can go over there and and uh, do a dig sometime you can do that but uh, <laughs> that would be actually not something i would enjoy doing careful <laughs> spo spoonfuls of dirt would not be my uh, joy, but to, to understand this then, there are a lot of things that are still buried or partially buried. We're going to look at a lot of ruins today, like, like the uh, picture on the screen. Uh, the ruins come from usually three different time periods. They come during, from uh, the time of the Greeks, and this was before the time of Christ, because the, the Greeks were such a dominant culture. And then during the time of the Romans, uh, the Romans start off and, and they're able to unite m much of the Mediterranean world at that time. Um, and then Christianity comes to the Roman Empire and so that affects a lot of things. And then in the Middle Ages, a little bit later Middle Ages, the Ottoman Empire uh, takes place. The Ottoman Empire is very powerful, and we don't always know a lot about it in, in this country, but it, it greatly changed uh, the Mediterranean world and really all of the world because it became such a dominant power for so many years. So, and, and it was Muslim, of course. And uh, so that changed the way much of, of the Mediterranean world was Christian, and then it became Islam. And so a big changeover. And there's, there's still 
the Christian church, but it's the Orthodox church throughout that area. So I'll explain as, as we go through, but it's helpful to know that, you know, that we're, we're looking at different stages trying to understand these things in context of the, what the Bible says about these different locations. So we, we pretty much go step by step, but where we start is not in any place that's mentioned in the Bible. It's in Istanbul. We fly to Istanbul. Istanbul is originally called Byzantium. And then uh, during the Roman Christian times, it's called Constantinople. And then becomes, during the Ottoman Empire, becomes Istanbul. So it's got a, a really mixed history. <laughs> but uh, it's good to, to understand. Uh-oh, now my... Now my clicker's not working. Where do I need to point, Warren? There. There it is. Where every place you go in Istanbul, you see mosques. And, and how do you know for sure if, if something is a mosque? The minarets. The minarets. There are domes even on Christian churches, but it's the minarets that usually are four different towers. And this is where... Uh, the individual who's calling people to prayer goes out and gives his signal for everyone to come to prayer. And sometimes it's a recorded sound and sometimes it's a cry. But uh, this is a, and this is just a, there's nothing really special about this particular mosque. It was close to the hotel where we stayed uh, when we were in Istanbul. But it, they just have it lit up really nice. And so we went out and took some pictures of it. There is a sign up there, and I can't tell you what the sign says. I don't, I don't know the, the Arabic language, and, and so I have no idea really what it said, and I didn't ask anyone. But it's, it's a mosque, and they're having some kind of celebration at the mosque, and so they have that sign up. Now this then, this building that we're looking at would be a what? A what? A temple. Well, it has, does it have minarets? It would be a mosque because it is a mosque and yet it was not built as a mosque. This is the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia, the holy wisdom. That's what it means. Holy wisdom. The Hagia Sophia is one of the grandest churches ever built in this world. And it was built in about the fourth century during the time of Constantine. Because Constantine was a Roman emperor and he wanted a beautiful church building to be built. And so it was built. And then centuries later, Islam came in and uh, took over the area and it became a mosque. And the minarets were built. And then later after that, they finally, as Turkey was getting established, well, as a nation, uh, Turkey said, this ought to be a museum. And anybody should be able to come in and look at this wonderful building and understand all about it. And uh, so it was a museum for some time. And now the current president of Turkey is uh, saying it needs to be a mosque. And so it's a mosque. <laughs> anyway, the politics. But it is a, a fascinating building, a beautiful building. It is, and I have been to many huge cathedrals, and I have been in some of the buildings in Washington, D.C. This thing is just overwhelming. The Hagia Sophia and uh, the amazing uh, size of this structure, and the beauty of this structure, uh, all the ornate things that are a part of this, of this once a church are just amazing. And it's really hard to catch it on camera and show all the, the different things, the different parts of it, the pillars, all the ornate work on those pillars, uh, the, 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 uh, all the lighting that is done, all the chandeliers that are there. It's amazing. 
Now this is in the entry of, the, of what was the church. And you see a picture of Jesus. This is a mosaic. And pictured as Jesus and the emperor. Did I tell you Constantine? I'm sorry. It was not Constantine. It was Justinian. It was during the time of Justinian, not Constantine. And Justinian is bowing at the feet of Jesus. And there are, there's the Virgin Mary and one other Bible character that is up there. But it is a beautiful mosaic, and it's just in the entrance area. But now it is serving as a mosque. And so when it's time for prayer, you, if you look real carefully, you may see some like lines across it. That is where they raise a curtain. They raise a curtain over this mosaic of Jesus and in several other places and so that nobody can see any picture that would be Christian in the, in the, the now the mosque. And so people can come to prayer and they can pray to Allah without having to think about Jehovah God. <laughs> and, and these are the permanent uh, fixtures that are on the walls inside the church. Notice those are Arabic uh, letters that are there and they, they're expressing things about Allah. And uh, so they are covering up like frescoes or uh, carvings that are Christian oriented. So again, it's, it's the politics of what's going on in the world today. Here are the worshipers that have come to the mosque and are, are uh, praying to Allah. And, and the, the, the building is just amazing. And I don't usually take pictures of anybody that's just there as a tourist. But this lady was there and somebody else was taking her picture. So I, I jumped on and, and got a picture of her too because this is the way that so many ladies are dressed in, uh, well, certainly in a mosque, but uh, throughout Turkey. Uh, dress standards are very different there. And the ladies that went on our tour had to make sure that they were very careful about covering their bodies and their heads. No, uh, not in this part. Not in this part. If you went into the prayer area, you had to take off your shoes. And um, still in Istanbul, this is the, some of the walls from the Middle Ages the, when the Ottomans came in and took control of Istanbul. And they have uh, just amazing, they have a museum there and they have palaces that the Ottoman emperors uh, lived in. This is, these are statues, but they look like what the Ottoman leaders looked like and how they would greet different dignities from different parts of the world. And uh, this is one of the palace rooms. This is actually a harem room. <laughs> this is where the, some of the harem was kept. But uh, they were uh, really an, an amazing culture. Uh, the, you can go through room after room in the museum there and, and they just have uh, amazing things that uh, they used inside this, this area where the, or all the leaders of the empire uh, were together there. And even though they created much beauty, it was really by things like <laughs> the axe that they maintained their power. Uh, and, and that's true of, I suppose, every country in the world. But they were, they were very well known for their ability to fight and to win battles uh, against uh, many other major countries in the world. In fact, uh, the stories about, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire could have swept in through most of Europe but did not, and, and there was some providential reasons, I believe, why that did not happen. This is, Pam, what did you say? Yeah, that's, that's pretty modern transportation. I just thought you might like a, a look at kind of modern day Istanbul, and it looks like a lot of big cities. And uh, there are people uh, going back and forth on transportation all the time. They're kind of crowded cities. And uh, you know, the people there are, were very nice. I didn't run into any problems dealing with people, buying meals and, and uh, 
you know, talking and visiting with different people at the museums. This is an Egyptian obelisk that uh, came from very close to the time of Moses. Uh, not sure exactly how it, how it coincided, uh, the time frame it coincided, but it was close to the time of Moses, and this obelisk had been built by one of the Tutmoses in Egypt, and um, it was decided that they were going, it, it was decided by uh, Constantine, Constantine now, that he was going to bring it here to Istanbul. And so Constantine had an army of people, and they worked out. You can imagine how heavy something like this is and how you're going to move it all the way from Egypt all the way up to Istanbul, and you've got to have horses and wagons and, and just a, an amazing plan on how to do this and bring it up there to Istanbul and set it in place. And, uh, but they did it. And it was all to, to try to make Constantinople the center of the world. <clears throat> this is the archaeological museum in Istanbul. These are the actual lions that were on the walls of uh, Babylon. They were retrieved uh, by researchers who were studying the ruins in Babylon, and they found the actual uh, parts of, of the walls. This is where, where uh, Nebuchadnezzar rode his chariot past. This is where Daniel went past because it was right into the entrance of the city of Babylon. And you can see, of course, where the lion with the wings, that idea came about because they were already using it. Babylon was that powerful lion uh, with wings on either side. This is uh, from Greek times, and it is just a beautiful casket box that was uh, created for leaders of the city or rulers. And uh, if you're able to see it up close, it's just, it just has amazing detail of all these figures and columns and scenes that are on the outside of this stone casket and uh, of course the, it's about uh, it's probably a little longer than six feet and it's probably about four feet high so it's a pretty big sized thing that uh, a body is buried in definitely somebody with nobility or uh, rank uh, in society now this is some of the snacks that you can find there Turkish delight kind of a gelatin and they add a lot of different things like nuts and dates and uh, different herb flavorings and uh, you got to try this if you go to uh, any place in the uh, Mediterranean world because it's usually around a lot of different places but I brought a little bit home Turkish delight uh, but uh, actually what's a little bit better is baklava <laughs> you've had baklava oh man they make some good baklava there it's really tasty stuff this is just one of the palaces on the Bosphorus River that runs through the city of Istanbul. And they had some magnificent palaces. They had some uh, amazing uh, buildings along the way. This was a fortress along the river, and this was to keep out uh, enemy armies that might be coming down the river and uh, attacking um, uh, the center of the, of the city. And so they had to build fortresses quite a ways along, and, and this goes back many centuries. This was our group. We had about 30, 35 people that were in our group from the Kansas-Nebraska Conference. And uh, I'm usually one of the tall people, so you probably didn't see much of me, but my head's in the back there. In fact, I was standing on the seats on that boat, and I could have easily fallen off the back, and <laughs> fortunately I didn't do that. I held on to Virgil. I think Virgil was in front of me and, and uh, didn't fall, but uh, we had a lot of fun. A lot of uh, pastors and wives and conference workers that were together through most of that time. And I got to spend a lot of time with my brother-in-law, Rich. We were roommates there, and we didn't really offend each other too much, I don't think, so uh, 
we stayed together during that whole time. And if you're going through Istanbul, you've got to go to the Grand Bazaar. Hundreds and hundreds of rooms, and they're all connected together, and they're all selling all sorts of things like, like uh, Turkish Delight and, and all sorts of textile goods and just beautiful things that uh, are made there in that country. Uh, this is not a Persian rug. It's a Turkish rug. And uh, they are just amazing in design. I know you on a screen like this, you can't see very much design and color, but they were... Well, these were several thousand dollars per rug. I, we, we got the sales pitch, but I didn't, I didn't bite. <laughs> they, would, they would ship it to us. They told us all about it, and, and they had some gorgeous colors. And it is an excellent rug. It would last you for generations. And, but I didn't have the money for it. <laughs> One of the beauties out on the uh, hillsides that you see an awful lot was poppies. And this particular color of poppy was out there quite a bit. And we enjoyed seeing all the poppies and taking some pictures along the way. Okay, we finally are, got to some ruins here. This is the uh, entrance, one of the entrances to the city of Thyatira. Do you remember who came from Thyatira that I talked about this morning? Well, Paul had been to, uh, no, he hadn't been to Thyatira. Not Luke? Lydia. Lydia was, came from Thyatira, and they were known in Thyatira for textiles and for being able to dye uh, their cloth, and uh, she had moved over to Philippi, and that's where Paul met her. But she came from this city uh, in, in Turkey called, or Asia, called uh, Thyatira. And Thyatira is one of the seven churches. So we visited all seven churches from the book of Revelation. And uh, there, there isn't a whole lot here in Thyatira. There were some uh, pillars that were left of a, a Greek temple to Apollos. Uh, underneath, this is kind of interesting, underneath the temples, they almost always had another level down below. And they had built... Uh, arches and hallways and they had storage rooms and and so whenever you find a, a temple there's usually something more down there to look for and uh, so just uh, a few pictures here in Thyatira. Thyatira never was a really big church um, but they were uh, they hung on through many centuries uh, until finally the uh, the town basically dried up and there are settlements around that area, but the town of Thyatira is just a bunch of ruins today. And we do know, we do know where there was a Christian church, but there wasn't much left there. Now this is actually uh, close to Thyatira. This was a settlement. When people came to Thyatira, they would come down here too, so that they could go to a hospital. This was the second largest hospital in the ancient world, it was right here, close to Thyatira, and uh, this is, you don't see very well, uh, but behind those pillars is an amphitheater, and that's where people would come and they would uh, listen to uh, good health advice. Did you know the Adventists aren't the first ones that thought of sanitariums? It's kind of a sanitarium because there was uh, hot water here. There was natural boiling water here. And uh, so people came for the warm water and the warm water treatments and the mud treatments. And uh, they, have a, they have a sign here. And obviously it's a little too small to read. But they tell about all the things that they used to do there. And they had, uh, they had priests that would uh, try to explain to people their dreams, what their dreams meant. So they even had mental health that they were trying to help people with. And they'd uh, work with you on your diet. And, and uh, they just had a lot of things that they were able to do uh, back in ancient times. If you wanted to come to a, this sanitarium and get better, uh, you could do it. It was all based on... Greek knowledge and, and not much Christian input into it. Another uh, place where there is, where there's not a lot of ruins, 
This is uh, Pergamum, and this is again underneath where a large, this is actually a marketplace here, but, but it looks like it could be a temple, but you see all these pillars along here, and this was a marketplace area. This is where you set up shops, and this is where everybody comes and does their business during the day, and of course, you always need storage for that. Uh, in this place in Pergamum, along with some of the other ones I'm going to show you, there was very little room to dig up the remains of the city. Because what happens is when the city falls over, then people start building over it. And then once you have brand new buildings that are there, then you can't destroy them and, and uh, find out all this information. So there are some reasons that many of these cities are not uncovered. This is Smyrna, just a little bit of ruins uh, on about a city block uh, in, the, in a city that has a different name now, but used to be where Smyrna was. In fact, you can see just right across the road from where the, uh, where the ruins were, uh, you see the, um, uh, the modern city that's there today. We can't always even tell if uh, in Smyrna whether there were churches, but we do see signs. Uh, we saw a, one of those stone caskets that were out there, and uh, good chance that that had some Christian background because we saw some Christian symbols. We just don't all know a whole lot more than that. This was, this I just threw in because I'd never seen this in a restaurant before. This was a honeycomb. And, uh, you know, the whole honeycomb is, is out there where you can go by and, and take, a, take a bowl or a plate of honey with you and, and uh, put it on your bread or whatever you're eating, but uh, just unique inside of a, a restaurant. This was a falafel that I had <laughs> that was uh, kind of unusual. I got some uh, pita bread, some flat bread, and, and I had some uh, carrots and uh, peppers and onions and squash and falafel inside the pita bread. It was very different, but uh, it, was, it was good. I enjoyed it, different from other falafels that I've had. Sardis. Sardis, remember, one of the seven churches, Sardis uh, had a, a large ruin left of a gymnasium. This is where uh, young Greek men would come to work out and to uh, do all the athletic events that they do. Uh, they were, they would restrict things, so the women would be in one area and men would be in the other area, but when men came to work out, they did it naked. That's just the way you did athletics back at that time. And so that's uh, the, the very front of a building that was quite large, and uh, they had lots of room for uh, athletic events to take place. This is the floor of a uh, synagogue in Sardis. And uh, again, there are many places it's really hard to see in these pictures, but there are many places where you see mosaic. Uh, this had been a temple uh, to Greek gods, and it was given to the Jewish community. Not only did Christians have a hard time uh, reaching people with all the Greek philosophy that was around, but then you had large Jewish communities too, and uh, to to penetrate that kind of community as Christians was not always very easy. Oh yes, oh yes, there's some great mosaic in, in many different places. Okay, uh, Pam was asking if uh, don't we have uh, mosaics in, in many other uh, buildings like uh, Congress and, and other places, yes. Uh, beautiful mo mosaic work. But this mosaic is all the way back before the time of Christ, and it's still there. Not, not the whole stretch of it, but uh, there are patches of it that are still there. And this is where a large Jewish synagogue was in uh, Sardis. And just... Uh, a break between the cities, we're going, 
you know, we're moving back and forth and we're going from one ruin to another and this just seemed like Bible times when the sheep were walking across the river and looking for better pasture and looking for something green and just stopped and caught a picture of them. Philadelphia had a, an amazing uh, area where they had a large gate and, and this is just part of the gate. The gate goes down uh, into the ground quite a ways more. And again, this is one of the situations with a uh, maybe two or three blocks at the most. This is where the ruins are that have been dug out or have been left. And everything else is city around it. And so you can see what they have and you can know where, where the, the ancient city of Philadelphia was. But uh, it is, it's very limited. And they know that they would find a lot of other things. They would, they would understand better about how that city was laid out, what was there, temples, synagogues, different things. But you, you, you're very limited in how far that you can dig. By the way, every place that we went to, we would stop and we would read the message. If it was the message to the seven churches, we would read that message. And then we would talk about it and we would pray together. It was a very spiritual experience. It's not just about learning history. And I really enjoyed uh, going through that and remembering these messages to the churches. It reminded me, and going and seeing these spots reminded me how difficult it was uh, as a Christian church in the kind of environment, because almost every place had a, uh, a temple worshiping Greek or Roman gods, and almost every place had, had a synagogue, where, which were usually very hostile towards Christianity. And it was hard for churches to get started. It was hard for churches to maintain over time, and yet they did. In, in very difficult situations, they maintained. And uh, some of those ruins are the ruins of Christian churches. Probably my favorite was Laodicea. <laughs> Laodicea is in a beautiful valley, and there are mountains uh, every direction, all the way around it. This is one of the gates that people would go through to get to the ancient city of Laodicea. Look on the mountain, you can still see some snow up there, and this is in May. And uh, this is not 14,000 feet either, this is probably more like uh, 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet, but it hasn't melted off yet. And it's going to melt off, and when it does, it's going to come through uh, rivers and streams that are going to come down through Laodicea. So if you get cold water in Laodicea, that's a good thing, because cold water is refreshing, okay? Now, they did have hot springs, too, and you could get hot springs in that area. You had to go a little ways for it, but you could get hot springs and you could get cold springs, and those things are okay. Those things are good. That's right. But you don't, want, you don't want lukewarm. You can't do anything with lukewarm. Lukewarm is not for cooking. It's not for healing. And uh, it's not for drinking. But, but cool, cold water coming down the mountains? Boy, that's great to drink. <laughs> that's good. That's why Jesus says... I would rather that you were hot or cold. Those things are good. It's that lukewarm stuff that I don't want. <laughs> uh, there are mountains that run all the way through Turkey. There's lots of mountains, and I'm not sure about that chain that goes through there, but they were all the way around this valley, and they had several places where, where water came through. This is in a Christian church, that was probably built in the fifth century in Laodicea. And it's a sign that there was a very good sized Christian community in Laodicea that had survived from early times because it was back in the first century AD. It had survived and now they had a pretty nice building. And it took us quite a ways or quite a while to walk through all the parts of the church. Anyone want to guess what this is? This, this is a baptistry, right? It's a baptistry. <laughs> and it's in the, like the shape of a cross, 
but, but it was filled with water, and that's where you could be immersed in the water. So I think that's kind of cool. It shows immersion, and, but it also shows that uh, baptism was a regular uh, practice uh, within the church. And here again is some mosaic work, and this is in a church building. And you, there were many different Christian symbols in that, in that mosaic that you could see on the ground. The, um, the sort of the, what do you call that, uh, with six sides? Is that six side hexagon? A hexagon that you see kind of in the middle there is uh, actually a symbol of the Lord's Supper. And there are actually supposed to be 11 people or 11 parts of it around the table which represent the disciples without Judas. So, and there were other, there were, uh, there was a symbol of Jesus as the bright morning star. There was, there were other symbols that they had put into the mosaic, but it was just uh, uh, fascinating that that much mosaic was still there and in good shape after all the years and after it being ruins for so many years. And, and, <laughs> One of the things that I noticed all the way through Turkey and Greece was cats. Cats are very popular. Cats go in and out everywhere there are people. They go in and out of restaurants all the time. Nobody bats an eye. It's fine. Everybody loves cats. And uh, so if you're a cat lover, it's a great place to visit. And here is a place that I didn't even take a picture of any ruins because there was only a few stones. It was kind of a mound, and it was covered with grass, and it's where the city of Colossae was. And in the Middle Ages, they moved from that site. There had been an earthquake that took place, and a lot of the buildings fell, and they moved up closer to the mountains, which was more picturesque. And so you see a nice modern city today <laughs> up against the mountains, uh, but it's in the area where the old ancient city of Colossae was. There are hot springs in Heropolis. Heropolis is in this whole area that we've been visiting with the seven churches. And so people come there and there, are, there were bathhouses. There were many other ruins. I just showed the, the area here that the water collects naturally. And if you look right behind us, you see a little bit of a hill that's all white. That's, you know, the line that has just uh, covered it uh, over time. And uh, it was really slick out there. We had to be really careful. I carried my camera in there, but uh, really uh, had to walk really carefully out there. But it was really nice, too. It was very warm, uh, hot springs that we enjoyed. It used to be people from all over the ancient world would come here to Heropolis to, uh, get, to get medical treatments and just enjoy the the bathing in the waters here. And I just had to get some pictures of olive trees. Olive trees were all over Turkey. Uh, you can see this is an ancient tree. It's been around for probably centuries. Uh, they never grow very tall. Uh, they just kind of grow big and tangled, and, and, uh, but they keep producing year after year after year. You know, I didn't see any, I don't know uh, their, their schedule for when they harvest the olives. And uh, I don't even remember looking up close at it. We ate olives every day, every meal. Every, every meal there were olives available, some kind of olives. And uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit different than the olives that we eat in this country usually. <laughs> but they're all good. I enjoyed them. Just have to get used to spitting out the seeds most of the time. Because that's the way they're made. Probably the one city that has the most ruins still that's part of the seven churches is Ephesus. Ephesus gets a lot of visitors, a lot of tourists that want to come down. This is one of the main boulevards of Ephesus, and I, I don't know how I happened to capture this without uh, any people that were there at the time, but I did because there were gobs of people that were there. There is a Roman road that goes down the hillside and you see pillars along the way on both sides of the road. This is where shops were. Where you see pillars, there were roofs at one time. And shops all the way along so you could stop, 
this is, there is no doubt that the Apostle Paul and others came down this road at one time as they were making their way into the city of Ephesus. And this is probably the best known part of the ruins that are left. This is the library building. They were quite ahead of their time in, in building and they had this huge library with lots of scrolls and uh, uh, many different, uh, different rooms that were connected with this library and still the very front part is standing today. And this was uh, standing before the time of Christ. So it's quite an, quite an amazing building. This is the amphitheater in Ephesus. Amphitheater there would hold over 50,000 people. It was huge. And uh, again, people, people came and they gave lectures and they did theater and they did all this in such a way, that, or they had created this in such a way that they were able to hear what was going on. And uh, just, just amazing the technology, the, the, what went into everything that they built. It was, there was a lot of smart <laughs> behind uh, all this ancient building that took place. This is the Aegean Sea. This is on the edge. Ephesus used to be a port town, but the ruins of Ephesus now are a ways from where the, where the uh, Mediterranean Sea is. The, what's that? A cruise ship, yes. There's a big cruise ship there. We didn't get on those big cruise ships. But uh, we took off the next day from this town and uh, went out to one of the neat stops that we made, which I'll mention in just a second. Um, for some reason, during the time we were going, uh, four of us got put in the group of old men. <laughs> And uh, so we were the four oldest in the group, and so we kept getting our picture taken all the time. Uh, you probably know Terry Bach and Rich Carlson. They're both, they're both retired, but they're helping with the College View Church at this time. And Pastor Ron Dupreeze is currently pastoring in um, um, Kansas. Great band, I think. And... I was the young one of the group, even though I was part of the oldest four that were on the trip. <laughs> this is the island of Patmos, amazing place. We, had, we went about uh, three hours, uh, three or four hours on the Aegean Sea over to the island. This is actually a Greek island, even though it's right next to Turkey, it's politics again. But uh, we got a picture of what the, the uh, Apostle John must have seen when he was going over there by ship, uh, at least kind of an outline of what the island was still th that many years ago. On the island, they take you, they take all the tourists to a building which is like a chapel and it's built up against a cave. And uh, according to what they tell all the tourists, John wrote the book of Revelation in a cave. Well, there's no historical reference to that, and there's, there's no biblical reference to it at all either. So we don't know where, where John wrote the apocalypse, but uh, could have been in a cave, could have been in other places. We did go to a monastery that has been built on the island, and it, it was uh, just a beautiful building. We uh, took a little bit of time there, and of course John's work of... of uh, Writing Revelation is still recognized and, and hallowed there. I mean, it's, it's a very important thing. And uh, there's some you know, very good Christian people there that try to keep that memory alive. Um, this, is, this is a picture from up from the monastery looking down out into the Bay Area. I guess what struck me about Patmos the most it was, it's a beautiful spot. It's a little bit of a dry island, but it looked it looked just beautiful while we were there. And I know that it was not easy for John on the island, but even in some of the difficulties that we go through in life, there is a lot of blessings that God still gives. And it was this beautiful, quiet island with the, the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea all around you. And uh, to me, it was, it was quite amazing. We are in Athens now. We went all the way to Athens, Greece. 
and you see the Acropolis. The Acropolis was there back before the time of Christ, and there were many uh, buildings that were built. They were built as temples to Athena. Athena was the goddess that was supposed to protect the city of Athens. And even the Parthenon itself, which is the major building, the building in this picture, and a little bit up closer, uh, the building that uh, probably a lot of people think of when they think of, of Athens. Uh, it's amazing to actually go there. I'm, I've seen hundreds of pictures of the Parthenon, and to actually be there right at the foot of the Parthenon, it is huge, and it's amazing how they made it. There is hardly a straight line in the building either because of the way that it was built. It, it, it is huge, believe me, but it's even made to look bigger. The way that they made it, the way that they made the, the um, uh, pillars narrow down as they went up higher gives it an appearance that it even looks higher <laughs> than it really is. But it's, it was an amazing building. Uh, one thing that I hid in there, there's a large crane that was working in there. And, and they're working all the time to try to keep these structures uh, up. And so there's a lot of repair work that has to be done. But it, it truly is amazing. This is one of the porches of another temple uh, to Athena that is just well known uh, in Western history. The... Uh, Actually, it was young uh, maidens who were chosen uh, to, have, uh, to, be, to have their form copied so that they would be pillars as part of this temple. And uh, they, they did this again. This is so many hundreds of years ago. They did this, and they had it there for, for so many years. Finally, those uh, pillars began to crumble. And uh, they have all of these pillars that are up there now are replacements. They've taken the original away to museums and they have the um, uh, replacement parts that have been made according to the time in which uh, uh, when, the, when the changes were made. But uh, quite amazing. The, 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 the Greeks, the Romans, they were very intelligent people. That is one thing that you have to come to a conclusion. And, and very skilled people, when they didn't have the kind of technology that we have and they're able to create that kind of beauty and that kind of art, it's just amazing. It's amazing what they were able to do. These are the steps that lead up the hill uh, to Mars Hill. These are the steps that Paul would have stepped on when he went up to Mars Hill to speak to the philosophers there. Uh, Mars Hill is actually kind of off to the side. The Acropolis is over here, and the temples are up there on top of the Acropolis, but people were all close together there, and so they'd come up down to Mars Hill, and they'd get up on top of the hill, and they'd talk together and philosophize, and that's where they invited Paul to come up and say the words that, that he did. This is, of course, at one of the museums there in Athens, and this is Zeus, a lot of... A lot of uh, statues that were created to Zeus because Zeus is the major Greek god. And some of the fine work that were accomplished, uh, these are gold cups, actually gold cups. And the amount of detail, the scenes that they have created on these cups are, are just amazing. I don't know how they could do that today, but uh, they found a way back in those times, and they are just, uh, every time you see them, you just say, how in the world could that, could that take place? This is a, uh, a different location outside of Athens away. There is an ancient city called Mycenae. And uh, what is significant about Mycenae, it gives you a whole different age. It takes you back uh, probably about 1,500 years uh, before the time of Christ. It takes you back quite a ways. And this is before Greece has really become a power. And so it's, it's more 
city-states. It's different groups that are controlling certain parts of the land. And this was a walled city so they could protect themselves. And a lot of people go out here. To, this is some of the early history that you have of Greece. But what was interesting, uh, especially to people that understand the Bible, the king of Mycenae was known as a priest and king, just like Melchizedek. Remember? Melchizedek uh, comes out and meets Abraham, and he's what? He's a king and a priest. Well, this was happening back in that time. The king took that role, too, as priest of the city. And uh, so it just it confirms the biblical story better. This now we, we're switching to a different city. This is the city of Corinth. This is where Paul came and uh, got in trouble. And the, uh, the Jewish population there was very upset about him preaching Jesus. And he was taken down uh, to the kind of the judgment center. And this is this old building, this ruin is the judgment center where Paul was brought. And this is where um, the, the Roman, or not the, yeah, the Roman leader in the city, he listens to them and he says, I don't see any reason that this man should be punished. And then the crowd turns on Sosthenes. You might remember that story. They turn on Sosthenes. He is the leader of the synagogue. And they beat him instead of beating Paul. So Paul is, is uh, saved in that situation. He's allowed to go free. What you see back behind that building is the top of a mountain. You see a little bit of a fortress up there, if you can see at the very top. And up at that fortress was the temple of Aphrodite. The temple there of that Greek goddess. There's a lot of Greek goddesses, but Aphrodite is the goddess of love and sexual reproduction. And because of that, there are things like cultic prostitution and other fertility rites that are a part. Now, some historians today are trying to say, no, that didn't take place. I think there's plenty of evidence that uh, has been known for some time that yes, it did. And Greek religion and Greek philosophy was not just a harmless uh, picture of, of uh, you know, idea about the great universe that's out there and the powers that are out there. It was going clearly against some of the ways of God. And uh, there were a lot of immoral things that uh, took place uh, at the temple to Aphrodite in Corinth. In Corinth, we saw this. This is a capstone to a pillar that was used in a building. And what is it? Do you know what the, what the symbol is there? Menorah, right? The candlestick, the menorah. So it's Jewish, we know that. And it shows that there was a, probably a good size uh, synagogue that was there. And this was used in the synagogue building. This is where the Jews became very upset with Paul uh, for what he was doing. And this one is one of the greatest parts. I know I'm going late already here, but do you know what, it, do you know what this says here? Do I have a light on this, on this uh, warren where I can point a light? Is that a, a, the one on top? Okay, there we go. Um, you can't see that very well, but that's an E. Okay? That's, a, that's an R, A, S, T. And that's a U. It looks like a V, but it's a U. And that's an S. That's Erastus. The name Erastus is there in Corinth, and it's at the amphitheater area. I don't have a picture of the amphitheater because I didn't want to put all that in, but Erastus' name is there, and it's mentioned that this slab of rock was donated by Erastus 
the treasurer of the city. No doubt a wealthy man, and as they're building the amphitheater, he makes a big contribution, and they've got a nice piece of rock there, and like we have done ever since that time, or even before then, he puts his name so that he, his name will be uh, remembered. Interestingly, Paul is writing the letter to the Romans, and he's writing it after being in Corinth and talking with the people in Corinth. So at the end of the book of Romans, you can look this up, Paul mentions that, that um, you know, this person says hi, and this person sends their best wishes, and Erastus, the treasure of the city, he says, sends his, his greetings to all of you in Rome. Wow! You know what that means? <laughs> That's confirmation. That's pretty clear confirmation. There's a lot of things we don't know real well. That's pretty clear confirmation, isn't it? Which just says the Bible story is true. I was excited about that. I thought, wow, that is really cool. Uh, somebody that's just mentioned one time in the Bible, there's his name. It's in stone. It's been there for 2,000 years, waiting for us to see it. <laughs> this is in Philippi. And I think I showed this picture this morning. This is the Agora. This is the marketplace. This is where Paul was dragged along with Silas, and they beat them there. And... Rich and Terry and I decided we wanted to go up to this Macedonian area. I explained that this morning. And so we are up there and we are looking around. And, well, before we get to Philippi, we've got to go back a little bit here. I didn't show this. This is a gate in Thessalon Thessaloniki. Uh, that's the name of the town. Now, we, we call it many times in the Bible Thessalonica. It's actually the, the way it's pronounced now is Thessaloniki. And this was the gate back in Roman times. This is a big Orthodox church in Thessaloniki. But what's significant about it, because there's lots of big Orthodox churches, but underneath were, for many years in Roman times, there was a prison that was down here. Uh, many people were kept in the prisons over the years until finally they weren't using the prison anymore and the Christians took over the prisons and they began to meet down here in this level and uh, they actually buried some of their dead in in some of the side rooms uh, as the years went by and then on top of that eventually the uh, Christians built uh, a large Orthodox Church now outside of Thessalonica a little bit is a smaller town by the name of Berea and they are more noble in Berea than they are in Thessalonica, according to Paul. We got a chance to stop here. This is a beautiful little city. This is just a fountain that's in the area where a Jewish synagogue was. When Paul went into Berea and he met with the people in the synagogue, that's when he said they're more noble in Berea than they are in Thessalonica. But he had gone in to visit with the Jews at, at their synagogue. And they were the ones that were looking at the scrolls. They were looking and seeing if what Paul said was true. So uh, this is right in the area where Paul uh, must have been. This is uh, some of the, they call it a Jewish ghetto uh, right now. But there's a lot of ancient roads and a lot of ancient uh, buildings that you can still see. This looks like a tomb. Guess what? It is a tomb. <coughs> It is the real tomb of Philip of Macedon. Who was Philip of Macedon? Philip of Macedon was the father of Alexander the Great. But it was Philip that actually brought Greece together. He conquered against several other groups and he established the power of, of Greece. It was Alexander that, that went beyond and conquered the world past then. But in 1977, that's recent times, they found Philip's grave. They found this, and they uncovered it. It is, it is still a, you know, a, a hump, hunk of ruins that are still there. But this is the place that they discovered. They have a museum over it now. 
that you can go to. And they didn't know what they had found, of course, when they first found it, but they started going through things. And uh, they, this is uh, Greek armor, a helmet, a, uh, a shield, and um, the, <laughs> what? the breastplate uh, that, uh, that, he would be, that a soldier would be uh, carrying. And uh, it's, it's specially made. It's not just a common soldier would be, wear, be wearing that. And they also found within here uh, the bodies of, of several women, uh, one no doubt being the, the queen or the, uh, the wife of Philip of Macedon with a crown and a kind of a footstool, I guess. This is, this is real gold <laughs> that is there, pretty valuable stuff. And they have done uh, other tests, d DNA tests, and they are quite confident that this indeed was the, the grave of Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, and his wife or wives, and they even found the son of Alexander the Great who died uh, when he was a young man and was buried in this gravesite too. Um, this is Neapolis. Neapolis is when Paul sailed from Troas over in Turkey, when God said, don't go here and don't go there, God said, go to Macedonia. So he sails all the way across the Aegean Sea from Troas to Neapolis. <laughs> and when he gets to Neapolis, he takes the Roman trail that is there. Oh, I forgot to say, there's a Roman um, aqueduct that is still standing in the city that has to go back to Roman times. And uh, it's just uh, amazing that it could still work today. It's not working, but it still could uh, because it, it was just built so well that many years ago. This is the Roman road that I showed this morning that still exists between Neapolis and Philippi, and Paul and his missionary team, they walked over this road. Pretty rough road to walk over, I'll tell you that, it is. But, I mean, from back in those days, pretty good stuff. Make, uh, make Omaha seem a lot better than what you thought. <laughs> the, the road's in Omaha, that is. <laughs> we go down to the river there in Philippi, and there's a beautiful uh, Orthodox chapel that's down there. And this is a baptistry. Uh, Orthodox Church baptizes uh, babies by dipping them, not by sprinkling them. And so you have to have a bigger container there. We walk through, and it's, it really is a beautiful chapel. But what interested us was to get down by the river where the actual baptisms uh, took place of Lydia and the jailer and, and their households. And there is a place there where you can do uh, baptism by immersion there. That's, uh, I think, a really cool place. And, and we just got out and waited in the water. It was Sabbath for that day, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I was in the river uh, at Philippi, and uh, we were just having a great experience reading the story about that baptism that took place. This is an entrance into the old city of uh, Philippi. This is part of the jail that was part of the ancient city. And we don't know where they sat and which room they were in and that sort of thing. But we know that this was part of the building. And it's still left today. And uh, just amazing to go and know that Paul and Silas were right there inside the building. And I told you that Rich said, hey, we got most of a day left. You want to go to Bulgaria? So we said, I said, why not? Let's give it a try. And just to say, we've been in a different country. So we went to Bulgaria, and we went to this town, Sandansky, and we see the sites that are there. It's quite amazing. We even got up in this uh, uh, Ferris wheel, and you can see the beautiful mountains off in the distance. There, there are really some beautiful places there. But here's where we came to that was just, to me, it, was, it topped off everything we had done on the trip now. 
because this was the history of the Christian church in Bulgaria. This is one of the first places because probably out of Thessalonica or out of Philippi or some of these places in Macedonia, Christians had come up that way and they had shared the gospel and now there was a Christian community in Sandansky. They believed that went all the way back to the time of Paul and since they were on a trade route that Christianity con continued to spread through southern Europe, which is just cool that uh, here we, we come to see how God had worked and how God had brought the gospel message and how it just kept going. It just went on forward. So that's it. <laughs> that is, I think I have a sign at the end here, but you can't read it anyway, so it doesn't matter. It just confirms what I told you about Christianity in Sandusky. I just had a great time. I learned so much. Uh, I know I could, I could learn a lot more about it, but to me, it, it just confirms so much about the, the story of the power of God working in the world. And sometimes we, we get to the point and we say, you know, the church doesn't seem like it's doing anything or going any place. There's so many problems in the church. You know, there's a GC session and people are going to get together and they're going to argue and do this and that. And, you know, <laughs> we sometimes get a little tired of all the church politics and that kind of stuff going on. Folks, we got to see beyond that. <laughs> we have to see what God is doing in the world. God did amazing things uh, throughout the centuries. Not just the first century, as great as that is. But through the centuries, God's word has continued to open up so many places and reach so many lives. It still does that. I know we're living in tough times. The power of the gospel is still real. And uh, I saw that as I had a chance to travel in those places. Okay, that's it. Do you have any, <laughs> do you have any questions or just End it so we can get out of here now, huh? <laughs> Leo. Yes. You know, I was interested in that too. There is, there is one little t a town that basically takes care of the tourist trade. That, that come, because a lot of people come and, and they're like pilgrims and they want to come and see where John wrote the apocalypse. Uh, but there are numerous houses throughout the island and according to what I read, I think it was probably Wikipedia, but, but what I read said that there are a good number of uh, wealthy Europeans, uh, like people who are part of royal families and they have property on the island and they come there at certain times of the year because it's just a quiet, secluded place. There's not lots of tourists and the tourists that come, they only go to the cave and back down again and they're gone. You know, that, that's about all that there is to it. And so it's a nice quiet place to live and there's not a lot of automobiles and traffic on the island and so they're able to just live this kind of quiet life on a Greek island. So it's a cool place to live. And if you have the money to do it and have a second or third house there, then it's a good place. Well, John probably, there are probably some kind of barracks, very humble barracks, where he, where he lived. You know, he was 90 years of age, about 90 years of age. He probably couldn't do real heavy work. They probably had him doing something, but... Uh, you know, doing something with a hammer, maybe. I don't know. But, um, but he was only there for about two years, and then they released him. And he probably went to Ephesus from there. The time difference was eight hours. I was eight hours ahead of you. And... Um, Jet lag took me, it took me a, a, really over a week to kind of get back on, on my regular cycle again. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night and I want to go, you know, I, I can't go back to bed. I got to get something done and, and then I get seven or eight o'clock, I'm shot. <laughs> but uh, 
It, it was cool. My body adapt. You know, when you go someplace, you're real excited, and, and your body adapts easier, and then you come back, and it's, it's harder uh, to recover from that, it seems like, for me anyway. Yeah. But uh, it was good. It was a good trip. I got back safe. I, I really did some stupid things when I was over there. I, uh, I lost my vaccination card. Really stupid to do. And I could have been held up there for a while. Fortunately, they, they did a test before I left Greece, and I was negative. Praise the Lord. So they let me out. And I, I'm, I'm getting the documentation for my vaccinations again. But... Um, I lost that. I lost the, the only mask that I'd brought with me. I lost that. And um, good thing I got the rest of my luggage home pretty much in one piece. And <laughs> but every, most of the time, it was like every night we were moving to a different hotel. And in many different places, you had to take out your passport and your vaccination card. And I had the two of them together. In some place, I took it out and I must have left the vaccination card and made sure I got my passport back and put away, and I don't know, someplace I lost it. I know, that's, that's the second stupid thing. I, I, didn't, I should have taken a picture and had it on my phone, and then I could have just showed it, but I had not done that. I had taken a picture of my passport, but not my vaccination card. So you get a little crazy, uh, you know, I mean, not crazy, you get a little absent-minded sometimes when you get a little bit older, and uh, I, I forget a few things now and then. And, but had a great time. I love it. I, I, I tell you, the re- part of the reason I went to Bulgaria, I said, when am I ever going to get back to this part of the world again, Right? <laughs> If I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it now. Well, I've been to Egypt. That's one, one place that I have been, and, and that was amazing too. Anyway, I'm not going to ramble on. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, it's a big world. And uh, Father, when we look back at what you've done, we're just amazed we, we see the truth of the gospel. We see the power of the gospel. And, Father, it's just great to be able to travel and, and see evidences of these things. We know you're a great God. We pray, Father, that our faith in you will only be stronger and more increased. Um, the older we become, the more we understand things in this world. Help us, Father, to never lose our faith and trust in you. And thank you for this good Sabbath day that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.